Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I always uh, enjoy my uh, trips to uh, Seville, although usually the weather is better than uh, this time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking about my work using uh, whole genome sequence to understand local adaptation in honeybees. I've also squeezed in a few things about uh, Darwin's finches and bumblebees at the end of the talk. Um, so one thing that we're interested as evolutionary biologists is understanding the genetic basis of variation we see in nature and the processes that generate it. And here are just some examples now. Now we have next generation sequencing. We can sequence whole genomes where people have used uh, whole genome comparisons to understand the the genetic basis of this phenotypic variation and, and processes such as selection and gene flow that uh, contribute to, to it. So, f like, for example, these uh, um, Heliconius butterflies, uh, Darwin's finches, and the cichlid fishes. I'll just move that away. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the work that I've been doing on, mainly on, uh, on this species, which is... Uh, Apis mellifera, the, which is the, uh, the honeybee that's found in uh, um, beehives uh, the, that's uh, kind of domestic and used by beekeepers, and also, but it also has uh, um, large wild populations around the world as well. So uh, it's, uh, um, and I'm going to be talking about my work looking at. Uh, um, the process of adaptation and uh, genes involved in, uh, um, in adaptation in this species. Uh, so just to give you a background into, honey, into honeybees, uh, this is the, the native range of Apis mellifera. It's found in, uh, um, across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And based on morphology, it's been separated into sort of four, maybe five main uh, lineages. A few years ago, we uh, investigated this using uh, genome sequencing. Oh, and also, um, within these lineages, we have, um, it's suggested that there are around 29 different subspecies, although the kind of biological basis of that is not really uh, uh, well established, I would say. Um, so, we performed uh, genome sequencing of a sam sample from around the world, and we could show that, uh, indeed, the, uh, um, based on genome sequences, we, uh, they do match what we see here. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about that study, but what I'm going to... Um, this is just sort of a background to genetic variation in bees. Um, what we've been doing more recently is to identify specific populations that have adaptations and try to understand... Uh, the, the genes and the processes involved in that, and I'll get into that a bit later. So um, an outline of this talk, I'm going to spend um, a lot of time talking about high altitude adaptation um, and work looking into the genomic basis of that, which uh, from what I've learned is something that a few other people here are also working on in, in different species. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, admixture and adaptation. And, and here I'm going to be talking specifically about the uh, um, Africanized bees that are found in, uh, in South America, which are a, a mixture between uh, um, African bees and, and European bees, and, and talk about our work, how we're trying to understand how uh, that process can contribute to adaptation, the process of mixing between different populations. And then finally, I'm going to talk about um, work where we're trying to use genome sequencing to study changes in, uh, in the genetic uh, composition of populations over time. And there, I'm mainly going to be talking about some work we did in Darwin finches and then some ongoing work um, where I have a new project working on uh, um, mountain bumblebees and the effects of climate change. Um, but let's start with the um, high altitude adaptation. Uh, so, and here I'm going to be talking about mountains in, 
uh, in Kenya and specific populations of bees that live uh, at high altitudes and our work where we've been trying to understand how they're adapted to that um, uh, in their genome. So it's been a popular thing to do, try to understand uh, the genetic basis of altitude adaptation. Uh, there have been several studies in humans. There's three parts of the world where humans live in high altitudes. Uh, so in, the, um, in Mongolia, Tibet, uh, and the Ethiopian highlands in, uh, in the Andes. Um, and uh, so and it's really useful to use these kind of populations because they're, they're generally uh, um, in contact with other populations and closely related to those nearby in the lowlands. So they can be genetically quite similar, but then still have some adaptations that you can find by comparing genome sequences. And, and a number of studies have done this. In humans, they've found uh, uh, genes that are all involved in uh, um, the... Uh, uh, low oxygen of the um, air at high altitudes, but they're kind of slightly different pathways and different uh, ways in which uh, um, the adaptation occurs. Um, so the populations we're interested in in bees uh, are found on uh, um, highlands in East Africa. Um, they've been described as being a, a separate subspecies. Uh, the bees at high altitudes tend to tend to be darker, and they also have uh, different foraging behavior, also larger. Um, so, and so this subspecies has been called uh, Apis mellifera monticola, um, and the ones, the regular African bees that are found at lowlands are called Scutellata. Um, different studies have uh, suggested different origins for these bees. Uh, it's been suggested maybe they're ancient isolated populations. Um, and, but also that they're just uh, a, uh, clo very closely related to the lowland ones, but they somehow have different adaptations. So that's one of the things we can address using uh, um, sequencing. And the other thing we're interested in is trying to understand what genetic adaptations they might have. Um, so we've collected, we've been using samples that were collected from two pairs of uh, high and low populate, highland and lowland populations in uh, um, two mountains in Kenya, Mao and Mount Kenya, um, which, uh, and the morphological description of these was published in this paper. Um, so, and a really nice uh, kind of advantage of this system is that you have basically two uh, po highland populations that are separated from each other but that they can have gene flow with, um, with the lowland population. So you have kind of two replicates in a way. And so what we've done is to sequence uh, nine or 10 bees from each of these four different uh, populations and, uh, um, and called the SNPs. Uh, so the first thing that you can see from this is, so. Um, that, that they basically cluster close to each other and that they cluster with um, other African bees. So these three um, subspecies are African subspecies, whereas these are all uh, European or uh, Middle Eastern ones. So they, they're found where they would be expected to be and they're closely related to each other. So they're not strongly differentiated from other African bees. Then what we did is to just make trees where we uh, compared the, uh, um, the highland and lowland populations from the Mount Kenya region and from the Mao region. Um, and we found that actually they're very closely related. So all the three possible trees um, are, are found very commonly. But the one that's found most commonly is the one where, um, where you find the the bees from the highland are most closely related to the ones in the nearby lowlands. So they're basically, you see a kind of isolated isolation by distance rather than um, them being uh, isolated according to their type of habitat. So this basically will uh, um, tells us that uh, um, they're not these ancient uh, um, relics. They're actually just uh, 
closely related to other nearby populations, although they may have other adaptations. So here you have what you get when you compare two, the two highland populations with the two lowland populations. So now you can see that you have these two blocks of very strongly differentiated uh, um, regions. So this is a plot of FST, which just shows the... Um, uh, it's a, a statistic that measures difference in uh, um, allele frequencies between the populations. And when we zoom in on these, you can see that it's actually... Uh, that the, that you, you find two uh, long blocks of, uh, um, of differentiation, uh, which uh, would appear to uh, support the idea of them being some kind of structural uh, variation with uh, distinct breakpoints. Here you can see that it actually looks like there are two different blocks, um, and, uh, but I'm going to go in... I'm going to, a bit later, I'm going to go into uh, how we've uh, actually refined, and refined this and, and tried to understand a bit more about the, where the breakpoints are and, and, and how this may be a misassembly in the genome that we're doing. Um, I'll come back to that part. But basically, you can say that there are these two uh, blocks, one on chromosome 7 and one on 9, which has very highly differentiated uh, haplotypes between the highlands and the lowlands, and also that they're replicated between both highlands. So um, a large proportion of the genome is found in highly diverged uh, uh, blocks. Uh, this slide shows the uh, differentiation between uh, diagnostic SNPs that we find in the two uh, populations. So basically what we did is to uh, um, identify SNPs that... Uh, differentiate between these two haplotypes and look at the proportion uh, that we see in the different samples. Um, so you can see that the yellow is for the, um, is for the uh, lowland haplotype and, and black are homozygotes for the highland haplotype. Um, red are heterozygotes. So you can see that basically you have two different uh, genotypes across the whole region. Either you have nearly all SNPs matching the lowland, um, which are these yellow bars, um, nearly all of them matching the highland in the, in the black bars, and then you have some heterozygotes. But you can see that there's a really strong uh, differentiation between, uh, um, between the haplotypes and the, uh, the lowland samples here and the highland ones here. So they're, they're very strongly uh, differentiated between the... Uh, um, between the two habitats. So next, uh, we wanted to look and see if we have any interesting candidate genes. We found, uh, so it's difficult to, to speculate on this because there are many genes in, in both of the uh, haplotypes, but the, the ones that uh, um, we uh, found most interesting are these uh, Octopamine receptors, which are found on the chromosome 7 haplotype, which uh, have been linked to uh, um, memory and learning, and in particular in foraging behavior, and even the way that um, the bees dance, advertising where um, hun honey sources are. So, uh, and we think that maybe foraging behavior is a is a something that could be different between these uh, lowland and highland populations. Um, and then in this, uh, we found uh, some other genes which are also interest, uh, involved in some similar processes. But, I mean, this is, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, um, to prove uh, the, the causal link considering there's so many genes. Um, one hypothesis could be that these uh, octopamine variants, uh, octopamine receptors might modulate foraging behavior in, in colder climates. Okay, so the next thing that we wanted to do was to look at the, uh, the uh, date of these, uh, or the, the date of divergence of these two different uh, haplotypes, which we believe to be structural uh, variants. Um, here what you can see is a, a tree of all of the lowland in yellow and highland in black samples across the whole genome. It's just a star. They're all really closely related. Um, and here you have the tree that shows the differentiation between, uh, in, in the region uh, um, 
where you have these divergent haplotypes, so just comparing homozygotes for the different uh, haplotypes. And, and so there you can see it's a, an extremely large divergence between them. Um, and what we find is that the one on chromosome 7 um, using it, it has a 3.2% divergence, which we would uh, estimate to be about 3 million years old. Um, which is much older than what we've estimated as the split between the different subspecies of honeybees. So here you, here you seem to have extremely ancient, uh, anciently uh, diverged haplotypes. Um, and also similar for the chromosome 9 uh, haplotype. Uh, so we, we find an extremely old divergence between these haplotypes and uh, which is much older than what we uh, estimate between the different lineages that are found all over the world. Although so far we've only found these uh, haplotypes restricted to a very uh, um, restricted part of the world, which is mountains in, in Africa. So um, we really don't know actually how this is possible. If anyone wants to speculate after, you're welcome. But, um, I mean, one, one idea is that it could be selection that's driven these differences, but you don't really expect the density of functional sites to be so high that, it, that selection on its own would, uh, would cause haplotypes to diverge to that extent. Another possibility is introgression. So uh, the idea that maybe one of these uh, uh, haplotypes blocks came from another related species. Um, again, we don't really know about a possible source population where that could be. Um, or the other idea is that it is simply just an ancient polymorphism in the ancestral population, that somehow it's been there for a long time and that it's had some advantage. Um, but still, we haven't seen it in other parts of the world. So. Um, but this seems to be the most likely uh, explanation. So, and, and also, because of the patterns we see, we think that it's most likely to be some kind of inversion because of these uh, distinct uh, blocks. So I just thought I'd go through a little bit of the theory about why you might expect to see, the, uh, see inversions in local adaptation. Um, so uh, uh, there's a hypothesis by Kirkpatrick and Barton and what they showed is that when you have populations that are connected by migration and that they have different local adaptations, then selection will favor that uh, um, if, there are, um, if there are more than one uh, low, if there's more than one loci that's involved in the adaptation, then selection will uh, favor them to have re reduced recombination. So basically, if you have multiple loci involved in local adaptation that are fe sort of loosely linked to each other than a uh, inversion that f prevents recombination between them will be uh, favored. So, um, and actually the, uh, um, the conditions for this to happen and should, should occur fairly often. So uh, uh, it's predicted that you, you should have uh, inversions involved in local adaptation uh, fairly commonly. So it's a very sort of general way for uh, inversions to be established. Um, if you have uh, sort of yeah, tighter initial linkage, then it's going to be less of an advantage. So it should be that they, they would normally recombine freely, but the inversion prevents that from happening. Um, and, and we have quite high recombination rate in honeybees. So actually, that would mean that inversions would be even more favored if, you, if, they, um, if they reduce it between um, adaptive alleles. So I just thought I'd also go through some examples of where inversions have been uh, um, found that have been related to local adaptation. So um, it's been really, uh, there have been a lot of work on Drosophila, and in particular there's been uh, clines in inversion frequencies have been uh, um, identified, which are sort of re-established when uh, um, in, in, in separate continents, they see these clines related to uh, climate in uh, inversion frequencies that are related to environmental adaptation. There's also uh, um, evidence from uh, environmental ecotypes of uh, monkey flowers. Um, 
and some really interesting examples from sticklebacks where using genome sequencing they've shown that uh, uh, so you have the freshwater and the marine forms of sticklebacks and the freshwater forms on, on, um, on two sides of the Atlantic Ocean have the same uh, um, adaptive uh, inversion which is uh, present only really low frequencies in the marine environment. And uh, then this is also related to a, a, another uh, concept called supergenes where you have several uh, interacting genes all uh, together in, a, in an inversion that are, um, that are uh, believed to be involved in adaptation. So there's this uh, in really uh, nice example in fire ants where uh, a supergene is related to uh, the uh, um, presence of one or multiple queens in a colony. Um, and then the uh, example from the Heliconius butterflies where inversions uh, uh, um, control these mimicry patterns. So I, I said that, um, that we didn't really know their inversions yet and uh, we still haven't really managed to uh, uh, identify the, um, the breakpoints that we see. So what I'm showing here is the, um, the divergence that we've see between the, uh, between the two different haplotypes uh, in the chromosome 7 and chromosome 9 in the region where we think we have these inversions. Um, and, what, and, and here these black bars basically represent the, the state of the genome sequence. So basically we have uh, gaps in the genome sequence and, and it seems like the breakpoints uh, that we see between uh, high divergence between the haplotypes and low um, occur in breakpoint occur in uh, in gaps in the in the genome sequence, um, and this kind of makes sense if if you have an inversion maybe it's uh, found in a repetitive region that's difficult to uh, to sequence, um, and so we've been looking at ways to try to uh, um, to to get sequencing across the gaps in order to show exactly what kind of rearrangements we have. Um, and one thing that we've been, been doing is uh, uh, generating a new uh, genome assembly for the honeybee. Uh, and I'm going to give a few slides just to introduce the technologies that we've used to do that. It's the, the purpose of that project is not only to, uh, to look at this, but uh, I thought I'd just uh, give some information about the kind of ways we've been using long, long read technology to, uh, um, to produce a much more contiguous uh, reference genome assembly, and then I'll talk about how it's cleared up some of these things. Oops. Yeah, okay. So uh, basically what we've been using are these uh, three sort of new long read technologies. One is uh, PacBio, uh, which um, can sequence 10, 20 KB libraries. The other is 10X, which is a linked read technology. You basically make libraries of uh, uh, long, uh, you tag the uh, um, DNA from the same molecule and then sequence using uh, Illumina. You can isolate it to the same molecule. And then finally, this is the bio nano optical map, which uh, allows, it, it, it's not actual sequencing, it basically is scaffolding technology that um, can show you, can uh, represent where motifs are found along a long molecule. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, success in different species now by combining these different techniques to, to make the most contiguous assembly, and that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, I should actually say we've managed to add one fourth technology, which is high C, to this as well, but I won't mention that. Um, this is work by Iggy and Andreas. In, uh, Iggy works in the Genome Center in Uppsala. Um, so basically the way that we, the way that a pipeline looks to, uh, to make a hybrid assembly, uh, we uh, first take PacBio reads, um, and use them to make uh, contigs. We can then add on the uh, 10x data, which, uh, and then by, kind of, these allow us to find reads that are separate reads that we know are linked together, and those can be used to uh, close up the contigs with some additional 
gap filling. And then finally, we can generate this long bio nano genome map, which doesn't actually have any sequence, but can be aligned to the sequence and then used to scaffold uh, the, uh, the genome to produce a hybrid assembly. Um, and this is the results, just, it's just a summary of, uh, of what you get. So the, the honeybee um, genome was uh, published uh, sort of 10 years ago using Sanger sequencing. Um, and the N50 or the average contig length was, was about 50 KB. And now we've made it about 200 times longer using this. Um, so here you have a, a kind of a histogram where you can see, uh, so this, this represents the, uh, um, the hybrid assembly that we make. So you can see the, the proportion of, ge of the genome and what uh, uh, contig length it, it's found in. So, uh, you can, so here you can see that we've, we've put a 5% um, you know, in this longer contig. And, and so basically you, uh, you basically have uh, um, a very large proportion of the genome is found in long contigs now. Whereas if you go back here, that's what you see from the previous genome assembly. So you basically uh, we've uh, managed to uh, make a much more complete and more contiguous uh, genome assembly. Um, of the bee using this uh, hybrid approach. So that was just a, a quick uh, uh, description of uh, the genome assembly. Now we can kind of go back to uh, looking at the inversion and see how well that's cleared it up. So here we have, um, we're remapping the samples to the, um, to the, uh, the new genome assembly and also included a, um, some more samples from a third African mountain which also seems to match the pattern of uh, having the same haplotypes. What we can see now is that we've actually managed to uh, generate contigs across that region that, uh, where the inversions were present. Um, so uh, here you have, yeah, so here you have the inversion region. And what you can see is that now what we have are regions wh which have sort of reduced mappability, which means that um, they're much more repetitive, uh, but they are present in the uh, um, assembly. Those were gaps before. And we can see that in this, in this uh, inversion that we can map specific types of uh, repeat elements that are actually show homology with each other. So this, uh, um, again, we still haven't managed to put reads from the inversion across these gaps, but it's very consistent with the idea that you have uh, um, kind of a structural rearrangement because if you have two uh, homologous repeats uh, um, in breakpoints, uh, uh, that's a common way that uh, uh, rearrangements can occur. So previously, you could see that we had this uh, um, FST plot with a, a sort of a, a block out here. Now that's all been resolved. It's a single uh, region with a more distinct boundaries. Um, and the same thing is found with the, um, in chromosome 9. Now we've actually managed to close up the gaps and show that there are, that there are repetitive elements that also show homology to each other in those gaps. So it uh, uh, matches what you expect from an inversion. Uh, so um, in summary, for the mountain bee uh, section, can show that uh, mountain bees are not genetically isolated from the lowland populations. They're sort of in the, in the majority of the genome, they're very similar, apart from in uh, these uh, regions which we think are inversions. Um, and those are extremely anciently diverged from each other. Um, and our best uh, guess for what's, uh, for candidate genes in those inversions are those in, involved in foraging behavior. So likely to be an example of how inversions are uh, um, involved in local adaptation. Okay, uh, so the next thing I was going to bring up was work I've been doing on uh, uh, the process of admixture and adaptation using uh, Africanized bees, which are found in, uh, in South America mainly. 
So Africa and ice bees have been called uh, uh, killer bees. They're these extremely aggressive uh, type of honeybees uh, that are, are found across uh, the Americas. They're known for, for this uh, aggressive hive defense behavior, a lot of swarming. They're more, more prone to swarming. Um, they also uh, um, more resistance to disease, and they, uh, they have a different way of foraging compared with uh, uh, European bees. The history of this population is that uh, um, the, the bees that were initially found in, uh, um, in North and South America were those were European type <laughs> bees that were brought by, by the colonists. Um, but then in, uh, in 1956, some African bees were accidentally released in Brazil, and then they've it's, um, been the, the source of, a, of this massive uh, biological invasion that spread uh, from Brazil and now um, for a few decades have been in the, in the south of the US as well. Uh, so this is a, a population where African ice bees, uh, African bees have uh, had some mixture with European ones and then there's been a kind of a hybrid swarming of, uh, uh, of this admixed population. Um, so what we're interested in is how this admixture between the African and European bees, how, has that had any contribution to how they're adapted, or is it just that they're African bees? Um, so what we've done to look at this is to, uh, to take samples of uh, Africanized bees from Brazil, from several different locations, but this is... The, the region where you have, which is very close to the center of, uh, of the um, Africanized <coughs> bees, which is in Sao Paulo. Um, and we uh, combined them with our uh, worldwide uh, data set um, from Europe. And here you can see a admixture plot, which shows the... Uh, um, uh, the proportion of ancestry from these four different European groups, the A, M, C, and O, and compared with the Africanized bees. Uh, and I think probably four is the most uh, informative, where you see these four different uh, European groups, and you can see that the uh, Africanized bees are uh, a mixture of mainly African, but with a lot from this Western <coughs> European group. Um, so then what we wanted to do is to see, um, can we map this across the, across the genome? And we used a, um, a tool called HapMix. What this does is if you have two, uh, um, two different uh, ancestral populations and you want to uh, map the ancestry blocks in a, in a, uh, in a separate population, uh, you can uh, use this... Uh, um, uh, it's a, a Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo method which uh, can uh, identify whether the blocks are from one or the other of the ancestral populations in, the, in, this mi in that uh, mixed population. Um, so we applied this method to our Africanized bees using the... Uh, European and African bees as, a, as source populations. And this is what we find. Uh, there's variation around the mean of 84%. Uh, however, we find one region here which has um, a really, uh, um, really low proportion of uh, African ancestry. And from uh, both sort of theoretical uh, um, predictions uh, and also backed up by uh, coalescence simulations, we, uh, we uh, infer that this is uh, sort of significantly different from what you would expect from just random mixing. So um, we think that this is likely to be a region that was under selection for having more uh, European ancestry for some reason. Um, here you can see this block on chromosome 11. You can see that this is the sort of uh, uh, standard way that uh, um, ancestry is varying across the chromosome. But then we have this one place here where you have a dip 
in uh, um, African ancestry, which is, uh, correlates with these blocks of uh, um, European ancestry. Um, why, does, why do we see that? Um, one thing that we noticed that uh, we found really interesting is that it overlaps with a, a QTL, which uh, has been uh, found in a lot of different studies, uh, which is involved in uh, um, both foraging and reproductive behavior. Um, and reproductive and foraging behavior are, 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 are believed to be pleiotropically uh, linked in honeybees, uh, something to do with the evolution of uh, sociality. Uh, but uh, um, so both reproductive behavior and foraging behavior is something that are likely to be uh, um, under selection. And, and, and so it seems like somehow, uh, well, a hypothesis is that we think there's been selection particularly in favor of European ancestry in this region, although we can't really say exactly what the, um, what the phenotype it, it, it presents is, but uh, it does seem that uh, we have this excess of European ancestry in the region and that it's likely to correlate with some, uh, uh, some phenotype. And I think this, this is possibly an example of something I would call um, admixture-mediated adaptation. Um, so, uh, and, and here are just some other examples of uh, where admixture has uh, kind of uh, um, promoted or facilitated adaptation in a similar way. Um, so there's an example of how uh, um, the uh, genes involved in uh, adaptation to high ad ad altitudes in Tibetans came from the Denisovans. Uh, there are studies that um, show that um, some of the um, some variants under selection in humans may have come from Neanderthals. Um, and then there's these examples of, uh, um, from Heliconius and from uh, Darwin finches where we think that genes that are under selection may have uh, switched across uh, species boundaries due to um, gene flow. Um, so in, in summary, uh, from this Africanized study, it uh, seems like uh, admixture mapping, by, by using admixture mapping, we, are, we think we can detect regions that seem to be under selection in Africanized bees and that, and that, these, uh, um, and that there's a specific region uh, of uh, increased European ancestry um, which uh, seems to have been uh, under selection in, in this population. Okay, um, I have a few more things to go through. Hopefully there's uh, time. I just, uh, um, so the next thing is uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, um, I, I think there's time, briefly introduce some, uh, a study from the Darwin's finches where we can show uh, sort of uh, evolutionary uh, change in, in genetic variation from uh, using historical samples. And then I have a couple of slides on a a project that I've just started up, which I don't have any data for, which is about uh, um, mapping the genomic basis of phenotypic changes in, in bumblebees. Uh, so uh, I think uh, everyone knows about Darwin's finches. They're a, an iconic species for studying evolutionary uh, biology that have sort of diversi div diversified across the Galapagos Islands and uh, um, and have different adaptations according to the, um, the source of food. And we've been lucky enough in Uppsala, me together with uh, Leif Anderson and, uh, and with uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant to have access to a lot of uh, uh, samples and, uh, and historical data about uh, um, from, from the Grant's long career um, living in, uh, in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, we were able to, uh, to sequence uh, um, samples of uh, all of the different uh, species. And this is a network showing the relationships between them. Uh, one uh, kind of important thing to note is that it's really not just a bifurcating tree. There's uh, been a lot of gene flow or, uh, and or ancestral lineage sorting. Um, the main thing I wanted to 
go into is some work where we've been looking at changes in, uh, in the beak shape over time. Um, and so to start off this study, what we, what we did is to uh, try to identify genes that were related to the shape of the beak, which is important, obviously, for um, which type of food they will use. Um, so here you can see that there's, um, among these tree finches, there are large, medium, and small that, have, that are both large size and um, which also are reflected in their beaks. Um, and then among the ground finches, there are also uh, um, three different uh, sizes, which uh, have both, both large in body size and, and um, the size of their beaks. So, uh, using, so this, these can be used as kind of independent comparisons of, uh, um, uh, of size from two different uh, parts of the tree. So here, when we compare, so, and this is using uh, a sample of 10 genome sequences from each species. Um, mm -hmm. By comparing the uh, large and small uh, types, and the large and medium, and medium and small, you can see that in each case we find um, a number of uh, sort of hits in the genome where you have large differentiation between... Uh, the, uh, uh, between the genomes in particular parts um, relate, related to their size. Um, and the most striking hit is this HMGA2 region. HMGA2 is our kind of favorite candidate in that region because it's involved in, uh, um, it, it's known to be associated with uh, morphology in, in humans and other species. Um, so this is, um, this region in particular is the one that most strongly correlates with the uh, differences in, in size and, and, in, uh, and in beak. Um, and here you can see that, uh, um, well, um, so then what we could do is to take this, this species, which is the medium ground finch, Geospizus fortis. Within this species, there's variation in the beak shape. So by comparing the haplotype that we see in that HMGA2 region with, uh, with the beaks and with measurements on size and beaks, we could look for correlations within the species. Um, and what we see is there's, there's a correlation with body size um, and there's an even stronger correlation with the beak size, but no correlation with the shape. So this, the, this locus is most strongly correlated with the, the size of the beak. And then, then what we can do is to uh, combine our um, way to genotype these different haplotypes that correlate with the beak shape. We can compare those to uh, um, historical samples. Um, so it's known that um, in 2004 to 5, uh, on the island of Daphne Major, which is the place where the grants have been working uh, mostly. There was a severe drought, um, which caused uh, um, a large proportion of the medium ground finches to die. And, uh, um, but it, it seemed like that it was specifically the ones with uh, larger beaks that died. And this is um, considered to be a, an example of uh, um, Oh, what's it called? Adaptive displacement, um, where uh, because they're competing with a, a larger beaked ground finch, and 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 so what we could do is to to genotype the birds that survived and the ones that died during that drought, and what we could find is that there's a very strong correlation between the the genotype at this HMGA2 region, which we think. Uh, which, co well, which correlates strongly with the, with the beak size and the survival. So it seems like this, uh, yeah, because of the competition with the large ground finch, which has a larger beak, they shifted their beak to a smaller to be able to uh, um, take advantage of a, a new food source. And that this is very strongly correlated with the genotype at this locus. So you can actually see that there's been um, 
change in allele frequencies uh, related to uh, uh, selection. Okay, I think I'm nearly finished, but I'll just tell you one thing about uh, my latest project on uh, uh, bumblebees. And, and because I think it's kind of fairly related to the last example. Um, so this project kind of came about as a, um, um, a result of this study by um, some uh, ecologists who are now my collaborators. And what they found was that when they compared uh, bumblebees that were found uh, in the Rocky Mountains in a, um, in a particular um, uh, locality, and they compa compared historical samples from 60s, 70s, and 80s to um, recently collected samples, that both of these two species, um, Baltiartus and uh, Silvicola, um, showed a significant decrease in the tongue length. Um, tongue length is really important for bumblebees because it's, uh, 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 it's related to whether they are more generalist pollinators, so short tongues can go to many flowers, or, or whether they're specialists, which mean that they're, um, the longer tongues are only specifically adapted to specific flowers. Um, so it seems, uh, uh, and in this paper they argue that this uh, uh, relates to uh, uh, evolution towards more generalist foraging because, uh, because there's been a, a reduction in the abundance of flowers related to climate change. Um, so what I've been interested in doing in the project that we've just started now is to look at whether we can um, study this on the level of the genome. Um, so this has allowed me to actually get involved in field work, which I don't normally get the chance to do. So I've been in, uh, uh, in the, the Rocky Mountains uh, last summer. And what we're now doing is uh, using the samples we collected to, uh, to make uh, a reference genome for both of these two species using uh, long read technology. We've got the data for that now. And we collected 400 samples of each species and uh, performed uh, measurements of their tongue length. And we're now going to use this to do genome-wide association studies to try to uh, identify the, uh, um, the genetic basis of, uh, of the differences in um, tongue length. And then we have access to historical samples, so we hope to be able to show um, or to understand how um, how these how the sort of the allele frequencies have uh, changed over time in this uh, in this uh, species uh, um, related to the phenotypes that have been observed. So uh, um, this is I don't have any data to show you about this, but uh, this is uh, my ongoing latest project. Okay, so that was pretty much everything. I think I managed to squeeze everything in. Um, so just quick conclusions. Uh, um, it seems like there's uh, uh, these cr we found chromosome inversions that are important in, in local adaptation in uh, mountain honeybees. Uh, we believe that admixture can be an important source of adaptive haplotypes, and uh, this seems to be something that's occurred in Africanized bees. And then uh, um, it's now possible using, using sequencing to actually demonstrate the effect of uh, adaptation in the genome using historical samples, and that's something that we're trying to do uh, more in future as well. OK, so just uh, some acknowledgments. Uh, these are my group and colleagues collaborators in Uppsala. Um, here, these are the, um, and in particular, a lot of this work is uh, done by Andreas uh, Wahlberg, who's a really uh, great uh, bioinformatician. Um, the genome sequencing project was done in collaboration with the um, University of Illinois and with the SciLife, um, the Genome Sequencing Center in Uppsala. And then I have uh, other 
um, collaborators that have worked in different projects. Of course, the grants are uh, working in the Darwin Finches, um, um, Casper and Martin on the um, mountain bees. This is a theoretician working on uh, admixture and our um, ecologist collaborators that have been uh, nice enough to uh, take us around the um, <coughs> Rocky Mountains. Um, so that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>